Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Goodwin, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Fordham University Center on Religion and Culture. Thank you for joining us today for Earth, Spirit, and Race, Confronting America's Legacy of Food Injustice and Discrimination. Today's conversation is co-sponsored by our friends at the Office of Campus Ministry as part of an ongoing series on race and faith. Tomorrow, we celebrate Earth Day and reflect upon our relationship with the environment and the natural world. Food and farming belong to this web of connections with the earth. Unfortunately, our food and agricultural systems are intertwined with the long, painful history of, ens of enslavement and racism in America. 100 years ago, Black Americans were 14% of all farmers in the United States. Today, they are less than 2%. This decline is not accidental. It is the product of land theft, discrimination, and the exclusion of black farmers from federal programs. In a recent interview on National Public Radio, head of the National Black Farmers Association, John Boyd Jr. described his fellow black farmers as a species on the verge of total extinction. Now, President Biden's recently passed stimulus bill, the American Rescue Plan, designated $4 billion in debt relief for Black farmers, and an additional $1 billion in aid. It's far too early to tell if this will improve the economic situation for Black farmers. However, there are reasons to be hopeful. Activists, gardeners, authors, and of course farmers are rediscovering Black America's rich agricultural heritage and its roots in spirituality and religious traditions. They're advocating for a new and empowering relationship with food production in the earth. Today's panelists are going to discuss these efforts. Now, allow me to introduce our guest this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Rufus Burnett, Jr. Dr. Burnett is an assistant professor of theology at Fordham University, and he has written on the blues, decolonial theology, and the Black American experience. His book, Decolonizing Revelation, a spatial reading Blues was published in 2018 by Lexington Books. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Leah Penniman to the Fordham community. Leah is the co-director and farm manager of Soul Fire Farm, an Afro-Indigenous center community farm committed to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system. Leah is the author of Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land, She's a 2019 recipient of the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award. A little housekeeping before we begin. In a moment, I'll turn over the conversation to Dr. Burnett and Leah. Then after 30 or so minutes, we'll open up the discussion to questions from you, our audience, including a few from Fordham students. We're at capacity today. There are 500 of you in the audience and we want to hear your thoughts. Feel free to enter your comments and questions in the chat box throughout the event. Please remember to be respectful to, to our guests and your fellow audience members. We are recording today and we'll be posting the video on our YouTube channel in a day or two. Finally, if you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation, no matter how small, to the CRC. Your support makes conversations such as today's possible. With that, I'll step off the stage. Dr. Burnett and Leah, it's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, David, for that, that very, very warm, uh, introduction and informative introduction as well as you talk about the American Rescue Plan. Um, I'm so delighted. I find it to be a great gift and a blessing to be here with D. Leah Penniman, the co-founder of Soulfile Farms. Farm, sorry. I, I'm just so excited to, to engage in this. The healing process that you lay out in Farming Wild Black has already begun to speak to me personally and even folks in my family of us as I've shared your work. So I do want to start off by a great thank you to you and all of the members at Soul Fire Farm for all of the, the wonderful work that you all have done. And so I want to start off with a, this question just to situate us and bring us into the space, although we're in an online space, bring us into the land of Soul Fire Farm. What is the mission and work of Soul Fire Farm? Well, thank you. The honor is mutual. And I will say with my full heart that 
like this work of farming, yes, it's physical, but for me, it's deeply spiritual. So to be Absolutely. here in a community of uh, religious practitioners and scholars and thinkers is wonderful. So I can't bring y'all out to my farm. So I'm going to bring uh, my farm to you uh, and just show you a few photos while, while I just tell you very briefly about what, what Soul Fire Farm is. So we're a 10 year old Afro indigenous community farm that is dedicated to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system which is a really, really big job for a small team of just nine people. Um, and there are three basic things we do at Soulfire. One is that we grow a whole lot of food and medicine. Um, we take care of 80 acres of Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican territory in upstate New York. And uh, all this food and medicine we grow using Afro-Indigenous regenerative practices. And we, we box it up every week and bring it to those in the community who need it most at low and no cost. Um, that takes a lot of time, uh, but layered on top of that, the second bucket of our work is education. We are hoping to inspire and equip the rising generation of black and brown farmers through our on-farm remote um, and partnership courses. So we have everything from a week-long residential immersion to youth programs, to a, a new fellowship that provides a stipend and mentorship for uh, farmers within their first couple years of their career. Uh, we have a Soul Fire in the City gardening program that supports folks in growing their own food um, in their backyards and side yards and church lots. Um, and then the, the third and final major bucket of our work is advocacy. We do a whole lot of public education to try to change the fundamental unjust conditions in our food system. Uh, farm workers don't get a fair shake in our society. Um, indigenous folks don't get a fair shake, the earth doesn't get a fair shake. So we need to build institutions, change policies. And so quite a bit of uh, storytelling, public speaking, public education, uh, you know, organizing and movement work uh, is also what we're up to. And, and all of this is informed by, you know, a, a, a deep environmental and spiritual ethic where we really understand that part of our work um, as human beings on this on this earth is tikkun olam. It is the heal and repair of the world. And so it's incumbent upon each of us not to complete the task of tikkun olam, but to uh, take one step in the direction of, of justice and sustainability. So I'll stop my share, but I'll throw the link to this up in the chat in case folks want to look at some, some more pictures on your own time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And as we kind of think about our theme, Earth, Spirit, and Race, uh, in the in the major title there, this this last piece of race is uh, where I kind of want to start. Uh, as David mentioned in his introduction about the American Rescue Plan, um, this is probably one of the biggest pieces of legislation, uh, potentially since the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Can you talk to us and walk us through? how black farming has kind of been underrepresented uh, in the history of the West. Absolutely, and to understand how monumental this debt relief package is um, in the recent legislation, we do have to go back a little bit and understand that, you know, at the end of the Civil War with the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, you know, the formal end of chattel slavery, Black folks met with the Union Army to discuss and design mm -hmm. Reconstruction. That's and it. actually a, a group of clergy, uh, Reverend Garrison Frazier and a handful of other clergy were the ones who led the charge. And they said to the Union Army, you know, all we need is land and preferably land actually away from white folks because it's going to take them a few generations to stop hating us. Uh, and we want to plant fruit trees and tell our children these are ours. So that's where the 40 acres and a mule idea came from, but that was a dream deferred. Uh, despite this broken promise, you know, black people did manage to purchase with their own money almost 16 million acres of land by the early 1900s. And almost all of this is gone. And it's not gone because folks walked away willingly. It is gone for a, a few a very specific reasons. One is that the white supremacist groups like the Klan, the White Caps, and the White Citizens Council uh, were aghast at black economic uh, power building up. Even these two and three acre lots, this was a real threat to that system in the South of the plantation system. And so the punishment was swift and severe, house burnings, lynchings, people driven off their land, their deeds stolen. It was a big push factor in the great migration. 
Uh, the second major issue that black farmers dealt with and continue to deal with is the U.S. Department of Agriculture discriminating against them in terms of doling out credit, crop assistance, technical assistance, and other supports, which gave white farmers an unfair advantage in the market and led to a lot of foreclosures. You know, added on top of that, we have heirs' property struggles. We have all kinds of things going on. But I'll, I'll, I'll pause on the USDA because black farmers actually got together and filed a class action lawsuit against the federal government uh, building on uh, decades of civil rights claims, you know, in, 19, in the 1960s, the uh, Civil Rights Office said that the USDA was the leading ca cause of the decline in the numbers of black farmers. And they won a major settlement in 1999, the Pigford v. Glickman case, a uh, huge symbolic se settlement, but it wasn't enough money to actually put anyone back on their land. It was more like to set the history book straight. So farmers have continued to fight for the debt relief um, that they need. And the Justice for Black Farmers Act is where uh, we saw that re most recently in legislation. And that piece, that sort of paragraph was pulled out and put into the COVID relief bill and passed. And it exceeded our wildest imaginings of, of what's possible. And it's a, a huge step um, on the way of repair and restoration of our dignified place on land as Black people. Absolutely. And so much uh, a part so much that is part and parcel of your work as uh, you've written Informing Wild Black and spoken in numerous uh, lectures is this kind of tension between the legislative piece, but somehow the legislative piece is helpful, but the healing process is much more deeper than that. Can you talk about the kind of ritual practices and the spirituality uh, that is part and parcel of your work at Soul Fire Farm and how this kind of augments the kind of legislative process towards the end of healing? Mm -hmm. That question is right on, you know, because I always think of what my friend, uh, fellow farmer, Chris Bolden Newsom talks about. He said, the land was the scene of the crime. Mm -hmm. right? You think about all that chattel slavery and sharecropping and tenant farming and cross burnings, you know, so it would make sense because the science does show, um, even if we didn't know it in our bones, right, that trauma is inherited. And so you have even the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors showing epigenetic markers of trauma. So it would make sense that all the way down to now, you have folks who, you know, our folks who come to the land and immediately have a slavery associations or just have fear um, that they don't name. And I would add to what my friend Chris said, but the land was never the criminal. Right. The land was the location of the crime, but not the perpetrator of the crime. And so we have our own internal work to do within ourselves and our community of restoring the sacred connection, the beloved connection between our people and the land that existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, so this this point of pain and alienation is really a blip in a much longer time scale of our, our rightful belonging. So the good news and this is completely anecdotal, I don't have any science about that, it's just observation of, of 10 years of running Soul Fire Farm is that when folks come to the land, she does a lot of the healing work for us. We don't have to do too much. Just the act of being free, you know, <laughs> being here because we chose to, being with people who look like us, have similar experiences, getting to engage in meaningful work, getting to learn uh, has time and again, um, shown us that the earth does what she does best, which is to compost. She can mm. compost you know, our food scraps and she can compost our trauma. But we do have ritual that we incorporate, of course. You know, I'm a, a member of clergy in the Yoruba religion, also in Vodun. I'm a double PK, you know, raised by two preachers. And, and so, of course, we are, we are singing, we are making offerings, we're asking permission before we do things using various forms of divination. We have our spiritual baths and, you know, we're not a religious organization, so we don't make anyone do anything or have you know one one way uh, but we do invite everybody to bring their spiritual practices if they choose to um, and share them with a community with the community acknowledging that that's always the way that our folks have engaged with the land there isn't a separation between the mundane and the spiritual so to speak absolutely that that that's a very uh term i would use here is cosmological difference when you talk about there not being a separation between the, the spiritual and the mundane. And can you talk to me about your own experience with how 
engaging in African indigenous cosmologies helps to reset, rethink, resituate, reorient uh, the ways in which we kind of think about land, dare I say, in the West. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it is a complete reorientation, would you say? You know, so I often tell this story, but I, I feel like it's it's just right. So I'll throw it in here, which is when I first started studying um, African indigenous religion, it was actually by accident. I was in Ghana, West Africa in my early 20s uh, to work with farmers and educators. But, you know, like I said, it's not separate. So found myself deeply engaged in Vodun and, and its sibling religions and the queen mothers who are the custodians of that tradition, you know, they said to me, Leah, well, they said, Amide De, because that's my name there. Is it really true, you know, that in the US, y'all will put a seed in the ground? You don't pray, you don't dance, you don't sing, you don't pour a libation, you don't even say thank you to the earth. And mm -hmm. then you expect the seed to come up and grow and nourish you. Uh, and when I admitted that was true, they said, well, that's why you are all sick. You're all mm -hmm. sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not as a relative. And so it's a total frame shift, right? Because even the language that we have among those of us who purport to care about the earth, words like environment, which suggest surroundings, things like natural resource preservation, which suggest um, hold a banking something for future consumption. You know, even in the language, you, there, there is a distinction between us and the rest of the earth and in, many indigenous religions, I can't speak for all, but certainly in the ones that I've studied, the idea is not that we are masters or dominators or that it's all here for us. It's quite the contrary. We came on the scene quite late. So we are the younger siblings of creation. The hawk mm -hmm. is our elder brother, right? The mountain is our grandmother. The wind is our grandfather. And so, uh, you know, in these societies as well, there is a, a deep sense of respect for elders. You know, even your older siblings, you would defer to them, you ask them for advice, you run errands for them. And so who are we, right, to kill the hawk? The hawk is to be revered and listened to. And to, and to cultivate that ecological humility, that art of listening, is something that we're a little out of practice with, to say the least. <laughs> so Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it, is, it is a frame shift. I definitely, I definitely resonate with that. And so much of what uh, you, you kind of see in the history of race, racialization and racism is this kind of constant uh, bargaining with what counts as being valuable, what counts as being spiritual, what counts as being um, circumspect and doing things reasonably or rationally. And so part of that resistance uh, that I think is being underscored in your work at Soul Fire Farm is kind of resting back a, a, a kind of notion of liberation that pushes to an alternative to the stereotype that would say the kind of indigenous practices that you are engaging in are kind of irrational, backward, out of, out of, out of step with this kind of notion of uh, the human uh, being the highest ordered creature and therefore having dominion as, as some would interpret it over, over the earth. So to, to put, a, to put a, a, a sharper point on it, many folks in, in black church traditions are kind of leery. You can see the suppression of the ring shout ritual in the African Methodist Episcopal Church as a kind of way of like trying to leverage a kind of non-African, right? Non-irrational perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you see those kinds of dynamics changing in your work or do you still see elements of them still present? That's a powerful example you bring up about the suppression of the ring shout as one of the many manifestations of internalized white supremacy because what more powerful thing can you do to a people in the process of colonization and subjugation than to make them hate themselves and to convince them that their ancestors were backward, stupid, right? And you see that, you see this, um, 
you know, it said that even if if all external oppression were to end today, it would still take us many generations as Black people to uproot the ways that we enact that oppression on ourselves and one another. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's actually heart, it's heartbreaking to me, you know, mm -hmm. to think about that, um, to think about the ways that we've been taught to hate ourselves, to hate our own ancestors and, um, and I'm not immune to it, you know, it comes up. I'll be sitting in a Ifa divination and be thinking, this is meaningful to me, but I don't know how I'm gonna explain this to my uncle. I'm gonna sound, you know, unhinged and and whatnot. So there, there's a lot of work to do, but it, to answer your question directly, do I see it changing? You know, I'm not a scholar in the trends, but anecdotally, again, I'll say even just in the 10 years that we've been at Soulfire, Early on, I didn't tell anybody about my spiritual practice. That was my own thing. You know, before I started the day with the students, I would go out and make my own offerings, my own prayers. But there's a lot of folks looking out, what, what's she doing? Let me get, let me see what I <laughs> see over there. Very, very curious. And at least with this rising generation of land stewards, it's nearly ubiquitous, the interest in the reverence for the desire to reclaim or continue uh, with our African traditional spiritual practices in some form. There's Absolutely. a lot of interest, yeah, a lot, a lot of interest in Vodun and Yoruba religion and Kondumble and Santeria, mm -hmm. you know, folks trying to find their way and finding their way to integrate these earth-based practices into their own life. So I think things will change. Absolutely. And thinking about that, that kind of outlook, that kind of tension between the local and the global. Uh, oftentimes we kind of think about uh, agrarian centered practices, if that term uh, is, is helpful or unhelpful, I apologize if it's unhelpful. Um, but as we think about land-based notions of direct democratic self-governance, right? Sometimes we kind of think of those as more kind of local situated kinds of things Right? And we don't kind of think about them within the context of like fair trade, big agriculture, genetically modified organisms in the global market, so forth, uh, and foreign policy. So how do you see the kind of economic visions um, as you've lifted up in your book, so traditions from West Africa, economic uh, traditions um, in Soul Fire Farm amid these kinds of realities, mm. big. Mm -hmm. I love these questions. They are so big. <laughs> <They're> so big. <laughs> I'm so, sorry. Yeah. One thing I'll say about economics first to tie it is it's not unrelated to what we've been talking about so far, because I think that we do a lot better if we adopted a practice generally of biomimicry. So when we look at the economy, so to speak, of the forest, right, what is it? What does a tree do when she's got a whole bu bunch of extra sunshine because she's living at the edge of the forest? self-facing. So there's extra photosynthate, there's extra sugars coursing through her cambium. She doesn't actually grow six, 10, 100 times bigger than the other trees, uh, you know, in the style of Bezos or Gates. Uh, what she does is takes those extra sugars, puts them down into a network of fungal mycelium and shares it with the rest of the forest. So the forest grows together. The forest is able to mast together, meaning that it can put out its acorns or its nuts at the same time and overwhelm the herbivores. It can share messages and minerals, right? So we could do a better job at copying the forest and learning how to share. Um, some specific technologies that we uplift um, in the book Farming While Black include the susu. Uh, so the susu is one form of, you know, Black women being smart, basically getting together, pooling their resources. Um, everybody in the Susu circle, which is a lending society, puts in a certain amount on a monthly or weekly basis. Um, and then the Susuma, who's the elder trusted member of that community, uh, doles out folks grants or loans uh, when it's their turn. And so it's the proto credit union, you know, it's an alternative to banks and stock markets and all that. Uh, another technology is the Combeats, uh, also called the Dokwe, which is a mutual aid society for labor. So you have to remember for most of human history, we didn't have wage labor. That wasn't how we did things. Um, one of the ways we did things was a mutual aid society. And, and these are not willy nilly, you know, show up when you want to work parties. This is, you are, you're part of the society. So when it is your turn to go plant beans at, you know, Farmer Rufus's farm, you're gonna go. And then when you go to Farmer Leah's farm the next week and 
uh, the person who hosts provides the, the lunch. And if it's a particularly arduous task, they also provide a live brass band to accompany uh, the workers and keep them motivated. Uh, but you know in that way that you'll always have the hands that you need uh, you know, to, complete, to complete the challenging tasks of, of farm life. And these things are scalable. You know, mm -hmm. there's no reason that we can't think about economic cooperation beyond the hyperlocal. Absolutely. And as we kind of turn to kind of open up our, our conversation, I'm curious about what you think those of us who are at different levels of uh, knowledge about farming and the intersection with race, what, what can we do? And the image that I want to lift up from your, from your many talks and in the book is that even those under immense amount of uncertainty of the American uh, slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade stopped to braid, bee, braid seeds into their hair. And so could you, could you lift up and kind of clarify that story? Because I think it's like very telling for how we kind of, may have some intrepidation about being involved with this, but there's a, a legacy of courage, even amid precarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is beautifully put. So the story um, that you're referencing is a really powerful one of our ancestral grandmothers in Dahomey region of West Africa, gathering up their seeds, you know, rice, okra, cowpea, millet, braiding it into their hair before being forced onto transatlantic slave ships because they did believe against odds in a future on soil somewhere and that their descendants, um, that we would exist to inherit that seed. Uh, so that, that is a story that keeps me going in times of trouble because I, I face challenges in my life, but I don't face challenges as um, unimaginable as, as what my ancestors went through. And if they could have hope then and not give up on me, who am I then to give up on my own descendants, right? Uh, a little aside about that is, as scholars have looked into the evidence and the story, it's become clear that, you know, there's no way there would be time once you know that you're going to be kidnapped to do your braids. So that means that there was a general insurance practice going on of stashing away seeds because there was uh, so much kidnapping and the slave trade was uh, widespread and ravaging communities. So people were expecting this and developing a practice of seed braiding. Um, as insurance. So all that to say for folks who maybe have trepidation or not as much knowledge about getting involved, I'll, I'll share this one other uh, story that's a modern story. And this is of my wonderful uh, blood and womb sister, soul sister, Naima. And we were traveling in Haiti, which is our maternal homeland, doing some work with farmers after the earthquake. And when we got to where she was, where we were staying, she takes out a glass jar with a, a serrated top and and fills it with mung bean seeds and water. I was like, what are you doing now? <laughs> like, oh, just starting my sprout garden because everywhere I go, I need to have something green and growing. Um, so a garden can be really, really small and action for social change can also be really small. And, and that's where we start and that's where we build. Now I mentioned very, very briefly in the opening, the Pirkea votes uh, proverb, so to speak, which which says, you know, we're not obligated to complete the task, but neither are we free to desist from it. So my belief is that all of us eat food, pretty much all of us live on land, maybe a few of you live on a boat, but it's incumbent upon us to do something around heal and repair of the food system. However modest that may be, uh, we can find some time to, to grow something, to call a senator, you know, to make a donation, to volunteer, you know, a little something to make things right. Thank you so much. This has just been life-giving, energizing, and hopeful. Um, I can't thank you enough for all that you've done and all that all who surround you and are uh, spreading as the trees do. This well, great wisdom and great energy. Team. We are a team. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to uh, transition now uh, to, to David, who is going to lead our Q&A. Well, thank you both. That was uh, a wonderful conversation. I know I learned a lot. And judging from the traffic in our chat box, 
uh, our audience is learning a lot as well. Uh, so I'm not going to ask a question. I want to turn it over to a few Fordham students who are joining us this afternoon. Uh, could the three of you all come on camera? Thank you for joining us today and being part of this conversation as well. So uh, Rachel, could you uh, share your question with uh, Leah and Dr. Burnett? Sure, yeah. Hi, I'm Rachel and I'm a senior at Fordham University at Rose Hill. Um, and I was on the Still Fire website and I was watching this video earlier today about how you guys honor the land and ask permission. And I believe you were in it, Leah, and then somebody else from another farmer as well, talking about your traditions. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you cultivate such a small, strong community within Soul Fire Farms, even though a lot of the farmers come from different faith traditions or indigenous practices, or maybe even none at all. Thank you very much for that question. Um, how do we cultivate a strong community? You know, well, you know, to be honest, like all communities, we have areas of strength and areas of challenge. You know, it's not a utopia. It's there are plenty of ways that we disagree or differ in opinion, uh, but we have made a point to be welcoming to a diversity of faiths or no faith at all, and to really celebrate that. So I believe the video you might be talking about is honoring the spirit of the land where I'm joined by uh, our next door neighbor and kitchen magician, Ria Ibrahim Taylor, um, who's Bugis from Indonesia. And her moving next door and into our lives has been one of the greatest blessings in the history of Soul Fire. She's just a wonderful human being. And her mother is a healer. Um, her mother is a custodian of the spiritual tradition. So she grew up with, with herbalism, with prayer, with clients coming to the house, with their ailments and then receiving support and, and learned along the way. So when she first came to Soul Fire, I remember Ria saying like, <laughs> she'd been to the U.S. around in the U.S. and was feeling very homesick because there's I mean this isn't universally true but generally the West is pretty devoid of spirit a lot of consumerism a lot of uh, nuclear family isolation ritual not integrated you know so it was it was very disorienting and I remember she came to Soulfire. I think we were doing Afro Seder, you know, something. I was like, this is like home. Even though it's not the same language, not the same prayers, not the same herbs, there is a commonality in earth-based spiritual traditions. And there was a recognition there. So from that moment, I was like, one day we need to, to do something about this overlap. And that's where that video came from. You know, so I don't really have a, an answer to your question about what makes community. It's so many things that make community work. Uh, but I do think it starts with with genuine respect and genuine uh, regard for one another's difference. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Sydney, uh, I believe you have a question. Hi, Leah. Thank you so much for um, all that you've talked about this far. I'm like I'm really interested, uh, especially in um, two things that you talked about. One, I'm an African African American history um, major as well as a biology major, and I'm a junior. So when you guys are talking about like reconstruction, I was like, yes, this is I love this stuff. I love talking about the ways that history reflect itself in um, the present. And so I think that's amazing that you have that background, you have that solid understanding of the importance of land in the Black historical context. It's like it's something that people don't oftentimes talk about. Um, and so I guess my question is, um, you kind of bridged the spirituality with this history knowledge and like a lot of what you talked about was kind of reclaiming the trauma and then addressing it and then doing something about it like you know really uh, really trying to work through in a way that's health conscious in a way that's conscious of the land and spirituality and so what kind of made you understand this connection like what I guess inspired you to understand that there is more to the black experience than just death. There is a lot of other really amazing parts of the black experience that we need to elevate. And so again, like what did what brought you to this conclusion? How'd you get here? Hmm. Wow, so much in that question. Um, so the first thing that came to mind is this experience that I had, we were just about a year or two into 
running these on-farm courses for black and brown aspiring farmers. And they're quite technical and continue to be. So I was particularly proud of my soil chemistry class that I offered and had these great metaphors to help us understand complex concepts like cation exchange capacity or cover crop mixtures and the different goals you have. And I was looking at the evaluations that were coming through after our course and nobody was mentioning these dope chemistry workshops, right? They were all talking about, you know, now I'm inspired to be my full self. I'm going to not drink alcohol anymore. I'm going to leave an abusive marriage. I'm going to leave a dead end job. I'm not going to limit myself. It was all that kind of stuff, this healing from trauma themes that were coming up in evaluations. And when that kept happening and kept happening, it became very clear to me that what we were doing on the farm was not just building another generation of farmers. There was some deeper healing that whether we wanted to directly address it or not, it was gonna happen. So we might as well make space for it and we might as well be more intentional about it. And for your sort of second part of your question where you're saying, how do I realize there's something more than black death to talk about? Um, to me, that was never a question. My orientation was never, um, yeah, never around simply resisting the oppressive structures. It was really always about reclaiming. And that started even younger because I, I started farming when I was a teenager and became disillusioned and confused when, you know, all the farming conferences I went to were super white. And I was wondering if I was being a traitor to my people, but fortunately had a wonderful elder and mentor, Karen Washington, who's a black farmer in New York as well. And and she kept saying, hold on, like, this is our legacy. We are not guests and visitors here. This is our legacy. And one day we'll have our conferences, we'll have our books, we'll have all of that just hang in there. Um, and she and I continue to work very closely together. And so I think that, yes, we need to acknowledge um, the pain of slavery. And yes, we need reparations unquestionably, but our relationship with land is much bigger than those couple hundred years. Like our people were the first, to compost, right? Our people were the first to make raised beds, to do cover cropping, to do squid and agriculture, like all of these amazing organic technologies that are now celebrated as new regenerative or permaculture come from African indigenous people and other indigenous folks around the world. So we have a lot to celebrate. Um, and that there's only so far the human heart can go just based on resisting pain and oppression. We have to have something to celebrate about ourselves to carry us forward. Thank you so much. That was like a beautiful, beautiful answer. Like made my day, thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Anthony, you have a question? And I, I applaud you for modeling good behavior for all of us. Thank you. Um, yes, I do have a question. Um, in what ways do you envision Soul Fire Farms as a continuation of Fannie Lou Hamm's Freedom Farms Cooperative? And in what ways do you see it as distinct or starting something new? And as an extension to that question, um, do you see or envision Soul Fire Farms as being epistemically distinct from Western and United States notions of environmental protection and from notions about the earth? Um, that's a loaded question, but. Oof, this is great. It's like, all right, I can put my college brain on with all these big words, <laughs> it's great. Um, so Fannie Lou Hamer, so a little bit of context for folks who might not be familiar. Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farm in Sunflower County was started in part because sharecroppers were being kicked off the land they were working for the audacity to exercise their right to vote. And so Fannie Lou Hamer recognized this problem and got some land and made it available to um, these former sharecroppers who were now cooperative landowners. And Freedom Farm, so many amazing lessons to learn there. And a good book is by Dr. Mon Monica White um, called Freedom Farmers. So definitely check that out if you wanna learn more about that history. So we are not going to claim to be any type of extension of that sacred work. Uh, that would be an audacious claim, but I will say we're deeply inspired by the work of Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, among her many pearls of wisdom that she has dropped for us, she said, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, no one can push you around or tell you what to say or do. And 
whew, if that wasn't already true, I mean, look at our behavior during the grocery store shelf emptying early pandemic time, right? If you got nothing canned up for the winter, you do not own the means of production, you don't have food in your root cellar, you're gonna be wiling out. The people were really wiling out and probably would be willing to give up their right to vote or put down their protest sign just to be sure that they could stock up their shelves and feed their children. So our freedom is very much tied up uh, with our food supply, which she recognized. And that is something we build on. That's why we, you know, we feed community. That's why we teach people how to feed community. Um, whether we're epistemically distinct, I don't know. I mean, we're part of society like you all. And I think what is the helpful framework for me as I think about our political philosophy is uh, you may have heard of the four wings of transformative social justice. There's a butterfly graphic. Uh, if you haven't, look it up. It's great. But essentially, you know, a butterfly can't fly without four of it, all four of its winglets. And in the same way, our movement can't fly without four of its major pillars, one being resist. That's the protest, the blockade, the boycott. The other being reform, that's working within the system to change it, you know, being a school teacher, being a righteous prosecutor, you know, whatever, elected official. Uh, the build is the third wing. Uh, that's, that's sort of the corner that we sit in, building alternative institutions that try to model some of our highest values. So the, the freedom schools, the co-ops, and then the fourth being heal. That's the, the artists, the visionaries, the therapists, the musicians, the clergy. Um, and we actually need all of that. And reform, which is squarely working within the system, I do believe is, is part of it, uh, mostly because it creates immediate relief for people who are suffering right now. So uh, yeah, we're, we're part of society like y'all. <laughs> Thank you for answering, I appreciate that. Thanks, Anthony. So at this point, I would like to share a few questions coming in from our audience. Uh, one of these, excuse me, I'm trying to pull them up. Um, this one's direct, directly addressed, um, excuse me, this one's uh, for Leah. What kind of practices do you use on the farm that work with the land rather than against it? So mm. a very practical question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so the practices we use on the land to work with her instead of against her, hopefully almost all of them, um, but I'm looking out at the farm right now, so I'll describe a few. One, my favorite is perennial polyculture which is a fancy way of saying planting a whole lot of things that grow year after year after year on their own together. So we have apple trees surrounded by perennial herbs like chives and mints that are attractors to pollinators and rodent repellents. We have rows of raspberries intercropped with mint because the two things get along. Um, another one of my favorite practices is low-till raised beds. So rather than having a tractor turn up the soil and put carbon into the atmosphere instead of leaving it in the soil where it belongs, we're using layers and layers of cardboard, mulch, compost, um, straw mulch, wood chip mulch, which decompose from the top down and let the earthworms do the tilling for us rather than having a tractor do the tilling. Uh, and the third thing I'll mention, because I feel like Dr. George Washington Carver needs a shout out sometime in this hour, <laughs> uh, Tuskegee University, one of the founders of organic agriculture, is, is cover cropping. And so uh, Dr. Carver really saw how this beautiful friendship between rhizobial bacteria and legumes like peanuts and beans was gonna save the soil because what they do together is they pull atmospheric nitrogen down out of the air and put it into the soil, replenishing the soil. Um, and, and yeah, most species have not figured that out, including humans. We don't know how to alchemize air that way. So. That's, that's what saved many of the soils in the South and that's what uh, catapulted the organic movement. So we do a lot of cover cropping as well. Great. So hopefully that'll help some of the, our aspiring farmers in the audience as well. <laughs> uh, another question just came in. How can European and your American farmers get in touch with a more familial relationship to nature without being guilty of cultural appropriation from indigenous peoples? Mm, that's such a good question. I mean, the good news is that all of us have 
uh, traditions in our own lineages of being connected to the earth, being connected to family, being connected to community. Some of us might be more generations away from it and have to put a little more effort into reclaiming it, but we actually don't have to take it from anybody else. Um, so that's really good news. And in cases where we do want to engage in cultural sharing, because that is part of being a, a person, I always encourage people to think about the three C's of non-appropriation. So those are um, consent, so making sure that whoever you're borrowing, whatever you're borrowing from agrees that that is a shareable item. Uh, compensation, whether that's monetary or monetary, non-monetary, and that would be defined by the uh, entity that owns the knowledge, um, as well as credit. So if you're doing something that belongs to somebody else saying, and I learned it from so-and-so, and this belongs here, rather than rebranding and adapting and commod commodifying. Um, but again, just going back, the, the really, really good news is that we all have community earth-based traditions and our own lineages that we can learn about and reclaim. So we have a follow-up question to something uh, you mentioned early in the conversation, Leah, the SUSU model. Do the recipients in turn in get the grants in turn or are the loans form a, excuse me, I'm, I just garbled that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do the recipients in turns get the grant or the do the loans form from the pool of money? How, so how does that work a little? Uh, people... Well, every SUSU is different. So that's why I was speaking about it vaguely. You know, at the SUSUMA and the SUSU members will determine um, their format for sharing. Um, there's one that we're involved in right now uh, in Ghana, West Africa, between farmers. And they, they do it as a, a rotating grant. And so they do some economic activity together as a community to add in in addition to their membership fees. They have a boutique shop. Um, they do some value add products and they're able to add in. Uh, my understanding is the original SUSU was more of a, a revolving loan fund uh, where, where folks would you know, receive from the pot and then pay an interest back into um, the collective pot and so that everyone's getting, everyone's making money on their investment, uh, which is the basis of, of the modern credit union. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, for everyone uh, who's watching, continue to put your questions into the chat box. We have a lot of great stuff coming through. Uh, here's a question about corporate agriculture. So corporate agriculture has taken over much of the family farms in the United States, and in many ways is hurting our natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, the creatures raised on the farm uh, are, use, are, are full of hormones and chemicals that they use in the raising of the, the animals. Uh, how can we stem this time as individuals? Mm. <laughs> how do we stop corporate agriculture? Yeah. It's like asking, how do we stop capitalism? So that's a big question. I, I just want to share this little anecdote because I thought it was so brilliant about how ingrained uh, we get sometimes um, with our current economic system. So this is a board member of ours, Tegan Engel. She said, isn't it kind of ironic that you have to get certified? You have to pay a whole bunch of money and jump through a whole bunch of hoops, right? To get certified as organic but there's no certification required or any hoops to jump through to completely trash the planet. And by that, I mean, poison your workers with pesticides, like, you know, dump nitrogen and phosphorus into the Gulf of Mexico, leading to dead zones with no fish, destroy the topsoil that it takes a thousand years to build one inch of topsoil and just, you know, wash inches of every year into the, into the rivers and in turn into the oceans to put carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. Like all of that, there is no certification required. And so I'm, I'm saying this anecdote because I think we need to appreciate the scale at which you know, our society is wedded to the idea of corporate and extractive agriculture. The Farm Bill, which is the largest piece of legislation that we have in this country by, by expenditure, um, it controls the food system. It just pumps billions and billions of dollars um, into corporate ag and specifically commodity products like you know, wheat and soy and milk and sugar. And I think we need to invert it. You know, if you look at countries like Costa Rica, they actually pay farmers for ecosystem services. And I'm recognizing that as an extractive term in and of itself, but things like pollinator habitat and carbon capture, you get a stipend for that as a farmer because you're investing in the public trust. You know, we don't have a, a system that robust in the United States. So I think we need to um, look at our subsidy structure. We need to look at parity pricing. We need to undo all of the get big, get out 
um, get big or get out strategies that started in the 80s with the USDA. So this sounds really dry, but policy change is, is gonna be the way. I think consumer advocacy only goes so far. Um, and a lot of it gets trapped in this greenwashing cycle where people feel absolved because they bought a salad and kind of go back to sleep. Um, so I do think it, it's trying to understand the food system and, and get involved in changing the farm bill so that it really supports the kind of ag that we wanna see. Great. Uh, oh, so we have uh, another question from one of Rufus's colleagues actually coming in from Professor uh, Leo Guardardo at the Theology Department. Uh, <laughs> so, so paraphrasing his question, uh, many people who are forcibly displaced from Latin America work on farms in the United States, but in the service of big agribusiness. Uh, this movement intersects with uh, immigration justice, the movement of forcibly moving people to farms in the United States with immigration. Um, can you speak about this intersection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's absolutely right. And just to, to fill out the, the topic a little bit more, um, the vast majority of food that is grown um, in this country is grown by Latinx and Hispanic folks, um, about 85% to be precise, yet only about 2% of farms are managed by this population. And farm workers, experience um, all kinds of abuses under the system, rampant wage theft, um, sexual violence, substandard housing, unsafe transportation, pesticide exposure, child labor violations. And this is not an accident. It's actually quite baked into uh, policy. Again, in the 1930s, when we had the beloved New Deal, and we had some of our first federal labor protections, things like the eight hour workday, the right to unionize, the right to overtime pay. This was not extended to farm workers or domestic workers because um, explicitly because they were black and brown. And you can read the you know, committee conversations and all of the edits they made to legislation to make sure black and brown people would not benefit and could continue to you know, work for subminimum wage, poverty wages and so forth. And we haven't updated that. We have not passed the Fairness for Farm Workers Act you know, if you're working on a small farm uh, with less than seven employees, there is, is not even a federal minimum wage, like none, there isn't any. Uh, you don't have the right to a day off in seven. You don't have the right to be paid uh, when you work these 12, 14 hour days for those extra hours. So it's very, very important that we equalize these laws. And, and to be clear, Soul Fire Farm is not, um, you know, claiming to be a leader in any way in this work, but we work so very much in solidarity um, on these campaigns and, uh, in our own small way, you know, make sure that language justice is incorporated into a number of our offerings and make sure that we're, we're showing up for green light and some other regional initiatives um, in support of migrant workers um, and other farm workers. Great. So we only have a few more minutes, maybe time for one more question. Uh, do any of our students today have a follow-up question for Leah and Dr. Burnett? No? Okay. Uh, can, so let's can I see. ask a question of Dr. Burnett? Because oh, I feel... of course. <laughs> so I'm really curious in your, like in your own practice and in your own scholarship, how do you see earth-based spirituality as re as relevant for Black people, if at all? It's everything. I mean, I mean that's putting it like kind of short, but. I mean, I agree with your your reading of it. It's like revolution without land is not a revolution. Social justice without land is not social justice. The land is so integral. And in my own work, I'm very inspired uh, by ways of think rethinking some of the, the, the foci in Christian theology. So oftentimes we think about the Christian tradition of being saved from sin, an original sin. Well, the kind of image of, of life with God prior to that moment is a kind of paradise, right? We think about Eden. And so when we look to Jesus and the crucifixion, we think about Roman imperialism, we think about uh, people being marginalized to the edges of society and Jesus' ministry trying to, to work with those folks um, and trying to show and trying to build another way of 
of, of building life together with God, right? And so for me, the old, sometimes Christianity can be too cruciform or too focused on the crucifixion to and forget that the revelation is not just through the cross, but the revelation is also through paradise, right? The revelation is also through life together with God in space and in the land. And I think for those Black Americans in my own research that have looked to Christianity, they have been contributors to what uh, Rita Nakashima Brock would call saving paradise, right? So saving the land is also a part of the salvific quest, a participatory role that humans play in salvation, the participatory role that humans play in liberation. And so liberation theologians, people like Avon Gabara and others have really pushed us to focus on this. Melody Harris and others have really pushed us to kind of rethink the role that the land plays in helping us to envision not only God's present in history, but God's promise to us to show God's self. And I think the highest form of this is love. And that love comes through space. So if we disconnect ourselves from space, can we really call ourselves Christians? Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm, uh, we have time for one last question and I'll pose this from another member of our audience. Uh, and I think this is a great question to end on. What are the best ways to support and use the wisdom that we've discussed today in our local contexts, in different settings in other parts of the country? Effectively, how can we help? <laughs> Well, the good news, as my daughter Nishima says, is that the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto your plate. So that means there's a whole lot of intersections uh, where help is needed. Um, so you can find the thing that you're passionate about. If you go to our website, soulfirefarm.org, we have action steps and action guide that includes the policies we talked about, consumer actions you can take, ways you can organize in your local community. Also on our website is a really neat tool called the reparations map check that out as well. And you can find uh, black and brown led land-based projects near you and it lists what they need, whether that's money or help with the website or you know other things you might be able to chip in. So definitely check out the reparations map. All right, um, we are winding down. Uh, I guess I have one question for Leah. What are you, is there anything you're growing this season you're excited about? I'm excited about everything. But the thing I'm most excited <laughs> about is that uh, my, my nickname is Perennial Papa on the farm because I really, really like trees and bushes and things that have woody stems. So we converted three acres of vegetable planting area into a new orchard. I just planted oh. uh, 110 apple, peach, and cherry trees. And in between the trees is an understory of uh, currants, elderberry, and hazelnut. And it's just beautiful, the nice 40-foot alleys in between the trees so we can have the goats grazing in and automatic fertilizing and mowing um, will be a nice self-sustaining system. And I, I really also enjoy digging holes strangely. So uh, my arms are quite satisfactorily sore and the field looks beautiful. <laughs> That's a very evocative image you just presented with us. I think perfect for Earth Day tomorrow. <laughs> Happy Earth Day, everyone. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are winding down. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, specifically our guests, Dr. Rufus Burnett Jr. and Leah Penman of Soul Fire Farm. Again, you can go to soulfirefarm.org, learn more about the farm and its mission. Uh, in the chat box, you'll see a survey from Soul Fire Farm. This will help them share their mission and, and message. Uh, you'll also be getting this in email from us tomorrow. Uh, the video for today's event will be on YouTube in a day or two. So keep an eye out for that and share it with your friends. If you enjoyed today's event, Think about making a gift to the CRC. And again, everyone, have a wonderful Earth Day tomorrow. We hope that you reflect upon some of the issues we've discussed this afternoon and on Earth Day and beyond. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Burnett and Leah, for joining us today. And thank you to all the students that came on and shared their questions with us and made this truly a Fordham event. Thank you, everybody, and have a great Earth Day tomorrow. <laughs>